All right, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we already have a few people. Uh, I see a, a number of people are joining. It's fantastic to have you uh, with us uh, tonight uh, or this afternoon. So welcome back to, to the Energy Institute members, uh, all of you guys who, who attended our previous events and workshops, and of course a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the, for the first time. So as a very brief introduction, uh, my name is Piotr. I'm a board member of the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network in the Middle East. And I'm joined today by my fellow members of the YPN committee, uh, Shahda and Andy, as well as the leader of today's workshop, um, Jessica. Um, in today's workshop, we'll be focusing on a variety of learning hacks. But before we jump into it, I, I just wanted to say a few words about who we are as the Energy Institute and as the, the Young Professionals uh, Network. So the Energy Institute is a professional membership uh, body working the global energy industry, delivering good practice and professionalism across the depth and breadth of the sector through knowledge and skills development, uh, whom you can see on the picture is our uh, CEO uh, based, in, based in our headquarters in uh, London. As a member of the Energy Institute, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, you can get access to a lot of great material to accelerate your career. Um, a couple of examples are access to knowledge base, skills development, um, development of, of good practices, uh, as well as, of course, being part of a, of, of a network and uh, events such as uh, today. So if you're interested in joining us as a member, please do not hesitate to, to get in touch with us uh, after the webinar. Um, you can either get in touch with Energy Institute directly or any of us here on this, on this call today. Um, the Middle East branch of the Energy Institute is led by the Managing Director of Travel Stop Briggs and our Honorary Chairman, uh, Wada Kanyam, who are both uh, distinguished professionals with uh, many years of experience in the energy industry, um, along with, it, with a number of, of, of senior committee members. This kind of gives you a flavor of the, of the type of people that are involved in our, in our organization. Uh, in terms of the Young Professionals Network itself, uh, in the Middle East, we were established as part of the Energy Institute just last year, at the end of 2019. And we are really a, a, a part of wider network of branches, which are spanning uh, four continents. Um, the bread and butter, our motto is that we act as a hub for tomorrow's energy leaders. And we generally aim to build a platform where young professionals can grow and um, develop their networks. Um, in terms of the YPN committee in the Middle East, uh, besides myself, we have Shahda Altaya and, and Andy Webster. Um, all of us are work in the energy industry. We are very passionate about the industry. Uh, and we're also here to, to, you know, to develop this network and, and, and work with you on, on developing your, your connections um, and your skills. Um, I hope you really enjoyed the workshop today. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Shahda now to tell you a little bit more specifically about our activities as the Energy Institute of IPN. Thank you. Thanks, Piotr, for that. And I'm very happy to have you all join us today for the session and very happy to take you through um, some of our um, big activities and ideas for future sessions as well. Um, so I think to start with, uh, here at the YPN, our main focus is, of course, the development of our members. And that's in terms of growing the scale and impact of the YPN as a network, but also in terms of collaborating with um, speakers like Jessica here today, as well as uh, universities and institutes and, and, and other kind of um, uh, partners that we can have, whether it's corporates or organizations and other associations of young professionals as well. Uh, now, in terms of the types of events that we usually have, um, we tend to have a lot of speaker events such as today's, and we've also been having these uh, bi-weekly virtual workshops um, since uh, August, I believe. So we've had quite a bit of, of sessions on those uh, where we have a speaker sharing their insights on a specific topic. Um, we've also had one of the very first um, virtual networking sessions. Uh, that I have personally attended in the past couple of months. And that was uh, the last session that we had. 
Uh, it was very interesting to connect with everyone virtually and uh, to meet new people in a safe uh, and virtual environment. Um, hoping that uh, many of you will either be joining us today or uh, we'll get to listen to this recording uh, on our YouTube page. In terms of pro professional development, we're also here to support our members, uh, whether it's the online library of resources that we have uh, that you can access and benefit from um, kind of uh, best practices and guidance material, or also um, by getting access to uh, a chartered status and, and getting that as an engineer or an energy manager or so on. Um, in terms of some of the other things that we have um, sort of in the works, uh, site visits when things go back to, um, uh, to normal and when we can, uh, ab we're able to access sites and so on, that'll be something that'll be interesting for our members as well as uh, mentorship programs. That's something that we're collaborating with the wider uh, Energy Institute uh, branches to bring about. And that's something that we've really seen a lot of uh, interest from, from young professionals here in the region. And uh, of course, you can uh, get in touch with us if you're interested to learn more about any of these events. We have our uh, email on the page here. And um, just to also give you uh, a bit of an overview about some of the Generation 2050 um, uh, updates that we've had over the past couple of weeks. Um, so as you know, uh, we're under the, we're, we're holding these sessions under the Generation 2050 umbrella. And basically that aims to give uh, a louder voice to young professionals around the world when it comes to areas of uh, climate change, energy security, and access to energy. Um, so we're hoping to provide that platform to uh, young professionals such as yourselves who are joining us here today. We've launched a survey um, earlier this year and uh, we've collected a lot of um, information and a lot of insights from this survey that we've now published as part of the Generation 2050 Manifesto that you can access online. Um, this is kind of an overview of some of the insights from it, but please feel free to check it out online and we'll also drop a link in the chat box uh, for your uh, reference as well. Um, moving on to some of the kind of a quick uh, glance over some of the um, different activities that we've had in the past. Um, ever since our launch in December of 2019, we've had quite a bit of uh, events, over 12 events or so uh, this far for this year. Um, I think we moved on to virtual events from April onwards, uh, looking a lot at the impact of COVID on uh, young professionals in terms of the competencies um, and the talent uh, development that they need to work on, but also uh, looking at some of the wider impacts on, let's say, the climate change agenda and so on. Um, we've also had uh, quite a bit of virtual workshops over the past couple of weeks. Um, so we usually tend to have one every, every two weeks. And um, with the year winding down, I think this is the last virtual workshop that we have planned for this year. So um, off to a good, uh, good way to end uh, the sessions and the different topics that we've had. I think it's interesting to leave off with uh, one on uh, learning hacks um, to kind of continue our personal development and professional development over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, you'll see we've had different, uh, different sessions on different topics here, and you'll have uh, access to it on our YouTube page, to all the recordings of the previous sessions. We'll also share a link of that in the chat box um, just after uh, the next couple of slides. And I think with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Jessica Lee Jones. Uh, she'll be sharing some of her insights on learning and some of the hacks and tips that she can share with us today. Um, Jessica is a multi-award winning engineer and astrophysicist. She is co-founder and CEO of a career tech company that, that, uh, that gives access to excellent careers for everyone. Um, she's also a visiting professor at the University of Wales, and uh, she discusses um, a lot of interesting topics such as employability and professional skills, which are very key, I think, right now, especially with uh, virtual settings. Um, she's also leading the flagship Enterprising Engineers program for engineering students and apprentices with the university as well. Uh, she has a lot of uh, great insights and a lot of great uh, expertise to share with us. And um, I have her bio on, on the screen, but I think that we're all very interested to hear
hear what Jessica has to say. So Jessica, please uh, share with us more about your insights and learning hacks. And thank you for joining us and making the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharda. Uh, let me just try and share my screen with you, if that's OK. Uh, I have to find it. There's so many windows open. Here we go. So hopefully you can see that. And um, yes, firstly, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, it's the unfortunate times that we're in at the moment, but it's really, really great to have the opportunity to, to talk to you today. So lifelong learning is this idea that you never stop learning, right? And in some ways, this is true, regardless of how much effort or initiative you put in, especially at this stage in your career, you know, as, as young professionals. Now, when you start a job, you learn new processes, you're introduced to the expectations placed upon you by your manager. You begin to understand the culture, you know, those unwritten rules that, that underpin the organization. And this is all learning. But if you stay in this job for a long period of time to the point where you no longer have to think about these things, and if you're not then making that proactive effort to, to learn new things, then you're probably not learning much at all. And this is the danger zone. So lifelong learning, you know, it's, it's not a new concept. Henry Ford once said, you know, it doesn't, if you're not learning, then you're old. And really it doesn't matter how many years you have on this planet. If you're no longer stretching and growing your mind, if you're no longer consuming new information and applying new concepts, then simply you're old. Now I would go a step further than this and say, if you're not learning, then you can't be innovating. And if you're not innovating, then as an engineer, you're at risk of becoming redundant. Enter industry 4.0. Robots are going to take everyone's jobs. That's what we hear in headlines. Perhaps robots will take some jobs. Robots, amongst many other technologies, can automate the mundane and repetitive tasks, providing space for humans to be more creative, to do interesting and more fulfilling work. So in this sense, robots are enabling us to become more human, you could argue. Not only can we exist together in harmony, like our quantum ballerina and her friend here, but actually technology is providing us with an opportunity to create the future. And so I am very much of the opinion that Industry 4.0 is not a technological revolution at all. You know, in fact, many of these technologies were used in the Second World War, neural networks, for example. They've been around for many decades. RFID was invented in the 1960s. So the value of technology in Industry 4.0 is in its creative application. And that is the responsibility of us as humans. So for this reason, whilst lifelong learning may not be a new concept, it is one of increasing importance. And for engineers, we not only need to keep abreast of these technological developments, but we have to create, design and deliver the innovations and the increased value required by our customers in this new era. So I'll share a brief story with you. When I was at university, I studied astrophysics. Don't ask me why. Um, we were considered to be at the cutting edge of science at the time. And I remember learning how a magnetic field can only exist between a north and a south pole, you know, Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. Before I had even taken the exam for this course, there was an accidental discovery within our own department at Cardiff University of magnetic monopoles found in artificial spin ice. So essentially, what I had learned had already become redundant before I'd even graduated. So for many people, education finishes at 21, but learning does not and must not finish at 21 or else we become redundant. So here is the opportunity. New technology adoption is actually shown to generate a net positive increase in employment. Robots aren't taking jobs, they're creating jobs. The difference is that the jobs that they create are more highly skilled and more creative in nature. So this provides an opportunity for businesses to increase organizational capability. 
It also enables us to become more innovative, increasing our differentiation in the market and therefore ensuring a sustainable competitive advantage. It's no longer about efficiency. Japanese manufacturing talked about um, lean methodologies. It was about the race to become better, faster, more reliable. Now the race is for creativity and value generation for the customer. This slide sets the scene really nicely for what I'm going to talk to you about, and that is lifelong learning, apprenticeships, and entrepreneurship. Last month, the World Economic Forum released a report on the future of jobs. These are the top 10 skills that the World Economic Forum identified as being the most desired skills by all employers, not just engineering employers, in 2025 just over four years away. Many of these skills would be traditionally considered as engineering skills. Problem solving, critical thinking, uh, technology design and programming as examples. But what's interesting is if you compare these skills to Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is a classification system for defining different levels of human cognition. It's, it's a concept that's very common in teaching. So for example, remembering is something that you learn to do in secondary school. You remember facts and you regurgitate them in an exam. Understanding is something that you begin to do at A-level or during the international baccalaureate, for example. And as we move further up this pyramid, we start to apply, analyze and evaluate different concepts and theories. Now this is the type of task that we perform whilst we're in higher education, you know, studying for a degree. So what's interesting is that if we compare the World Economic Forum top 10 skills to Bloom's taxonomy, what we see is that most of these skills are higher level cognitive skills. And this reinforces the idea that jobs in the future will require more advanced cognitive skills. Skills that perhaps we don't necessarily get from education. Notice also that one of the top skills is self-management of one's own learning. So to manage your own learning and development, you have to have a good degree of self-awareness. You have to be introspective. It's a higher level cognitive skill. So I pose a question to you. Um, I have my chat box open, so, so please respond. Can learning be a bad thing? We've talked so far about learning in a very positive sense, but can learning ever be bad? Tell me what you think, perhaps give me an example. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Yes, okay, Mark. Yeah, in all labor there is reward. Aimless learning may be bad. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so there's, there's a good mix of opinions here. Andy, that's really interesting. Believe it's truth versus something to be explored. So let's try and answer this question. Let's break it down. So we can learn things like knowledge, skills, you know, culture to some degree can be learned. We learn culture when we go into an organization. We can learn language. Um, we develop, on the other hand, habits. We can also develop empathy for people. Leadership is an example that's really widely debated. Can leadership be learned? Is leadership a natural ability? Is, is somebody a natural born leader? Does that exist? I would argue in my experience that leadership absolutely can be developed in conjunction with empathy and good habits. I've seen many people develop into exceptional leaders. So to answer this question, behavior and attitude can be learned from those around us. We can pick those things up relatively quickly. Perspective is developed from our experiences over time. And in this sense, learning can definitely be bad. I have witnessed many people learn, you know, bad or obstructive workplace behaviors. I have seen many people develop negative self perceptions and lose confidence in the workplace, and that can be quite damaging. The quality of learning, as it's been alluded to in the chat, is often based upon the environment in which you learn something. 
So that is why taking responsibility for what you learn and who you learn from and challenging what you learn, as Andy has said, is very important as it can be a very positive experience to learn something or to develop something, but it can also be very damaging. And the longer that you develop something, the harder it is to reverse or change. So it, it always fascinates me when I see a job advert that asks for 10 plus years experience, because why is that automatically a good thing? You could end up hiring someone that has 10 years experience of doing something the wrong way. And then it would be very hard to change the way that that person works. So you create a problem for yourself. So this is, you know, so, something that's worth reflecting on, I suppose. So apprenticeships are coming. It's been really, really interesting for me in, in the run up to this presentation to read about the apprenticeships debate going on in the UAE right now. I see that some schools are delivering BTECs and that this is very controversial. And it's always interesting for me to see how different countries approach apprenticeships and how they can mean different things to different people. My organization, Youngo Solutions, provides thought leadership on apprenticeships in the UK. We recently wrote a report for Welsh Government on a future vision for apprenticeships in Wales and what that should look like. And, you know, here's an extract. And essentially what we're saying is that apprenticeships should provide fluid pathways like, you know, imagine a series of escalators and people should be able to hop on and hop off those escalators at any point in their career. So you're constantly getting that top up in learning experience. And apprenticeships are about developing skills as much as knowledge and particularly about developing transferable skills that allow you to change direction in your career at any point in time. Because I think it's important, you know, particularly as we've seen during COVID, many industries have struggled and many new industries have been born. So we have to be agile in our career development and in our learning. We have to be able to adapt and so we have to look for those transferable skills. So the fundamental concept, in my view, of an apprenticeship is that everybody is on a journey somewhere. We are all learning all of the time. So if, if apprenticeships are new to you, then let me give you a little overview. So apprenticeships can exist at any level of education, contrary to popular belief. They're not sort of the second class option. You can complete a degree through an apprenticeship now. Apprenticeships are jobs, so you are doing a job and you are learning and you are earning an income all at the same time, which is, again, a very interesting concept. So you do not incur a fee for your learning, usually, and uh, therefore you do not incur the debt that might go with a university education. So in Wales, we are pioneering this concept of a shared apprenticeship, and this is particularly good for small and medium sized businesses who maybe can't afford an apprentice. So in a shared apprenticeship scheme, what you have is a group, a pool of apprentices that rotate around different organizations. And the purpose of that is you get a, a, an additional dimension to your learning experience as you move around different uh, companies and learn different things. But you also transfer that best practice. So it's beneficial to the apprentice and it's also beneficial to the company. So apprenticeships are a fantastic vehicle for lifelong learning. You can start one at any point. In my own organization at Younger, we are all apprentices. It's actually our policy. Uh, when anybody joins us, we make it very clear that if you join us, you will be an apprentice. You will be a lifelong learner. My executive chair is studying maths and economics at the moment, not particularly related to his role, but obviously he learns certain transferable skills from it. My lead software developer was previously uh, an electronics engineer and has you know, converted to the dark side through a software apprenticeships. And um, I myself, I've studied HR and I'm currently doing an MBA. So we're all on that learning journey. And that's something that's really fundamental to our organization. So apprenticeships are coming to the UAE, it would seem. Brace yourself. This could be an excellent means of getting that lifelong learning experience. So let's look at something else, entrepreneurship. Are you familiar this word, with this word? Just uh, pop in the chat for me, if, you, if you've heard of this concept before. 
<laughs> no, no, okay, excellent, good. A few people, okay. Right, so entrepreneurship. This is very much like entrepreneurship, except you're employed by an organization. So entrepreneurship is more common in large corporates, but it can exist in any organization. And the advantage of being an entrepreneur as opposed to an entrepreneur is that you get to be creative, you get to take risks, you get to develop new products that may or may not take off, new services, but all along you're being supported by the resources of the organization. So you're being supported in a safe environment to commercialize some of those products and services. Now for many people it's not possible to become an entrepreneur for financial reasons, for you know, beliefs, for, for, for any particular reason, it may not be possible. So entrepreneurship is, is a really interesting alternative. Now, it's very controversial as previous concepts I've shown you. So Harvard Business Review describes the myth of an entrepreneur. They don't believe it exists. Um, they quote a guy called Steve Sasson, who's in the, this picture here. And um, Steve was an entrepreneur and an engineer at Kodak, and he developed the digital camera. But Kodak was too slow and too bureaucratic to react to his innovation. They got left for dust in the race to digitalization and virtually lost their entire market share. So in Harvard, Biz Harvard Business Review's perspective, entrepreneurship is not a real thing. It doesn't work. However, I would argue that now is the perfect time to become an entrepreneur. All of the stars are aligning, so it would seem. For example, technology in the information age is driving the rate of innovation. The rate of innovation is increasing and innovation is becoming democratized. More people are able to engage in innovation because of open source technologies, you know, because of the, the availability of, of information. Remote working practices and digital working tools like Zoom are making it much easier for people to collaborate and are generating a much greater exposure to innovation. And then finally, the millennials, um, probably sort of our generation and below, uh, are referred to by McKinsey as the purpose generation because it seems that millennials are far more interested in solving the world's problems, you know, these big issues that affect society at large. They're more interested in, in solving those problems than they are in becoming high flyers. And so entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship in this sense is very appealing to millennials. And of course, we shouldn't forget that the impact of COVID-19 on the industrial and economic landscape means that many companies, particularly big companies, have an increased need to innovate or else they become at risk of being redundant in this new world. So as famous entrepreneur Biz Stone said, when our backs are against the wall, we innovate. So in terms of learning, there is no better, more rounded learning experience than being an entrepreneur. And this is because you're venturing into the unknown. You are carving out a new path. So the skills that you learn shape every aspect of your per personal and professional skill set. Before I founded Yungo, I was an entrepreneur within the manufacturing industry. And this was one of the most exciting times of my life. You know, the breadth of skills that you learn, um, obviously, you know, spurred me on to set up my own business, but just affect so many different aspects of your life. It's such a good learning experience. So for the bit that I think you've all been waiting for, how do you become a lifelong learner without breaking the bank? Uh, you might be quite disappointed to find out that it's really quite simple. Um, it doesn't require you to do 15 degrees in your lifetime. Um, so the first thing is don't view your career as a ladder. I had a very wise friend who once said, your career is a jungle gym, not a ladder. So your learning experiences come from developing those different cognitive muscles and skills. So forget about, you know, the fastest route to ascending up the ladder and think about how you can develop different aspects of your professional profile. You know, can you go and get a rotation in the purchasing department, for example, and, and learn what happens in there because those skills become relevant, you know, in, in other parts of your journey. 
seek mentorship, whether that's from your company, whether it's from the Energy Institute, it looks like there's some fantastic programs available to you to, to meet new people. Um, perhaps from the industry more broadly, use LinkedIn, for example. Um, mentorship can be a very formal process. It can be an informal process. Reverse mentoring is also interesting. So the idea of, you know, perhaps you mentoring somebody more senior and that exchange of perspective is, is really quite beneficial in, in both sort of learning experiences for both individuals. Seek out some rotation opportunities. So as we say, go and spend some, you know, a couple of weeks in purchasing, pick up a cross functional project with another team, um, develop some additional technical skills perhaps by going into you know, another department. Make the most of your membership engagement. I joined the Institution for Engineering and Technology when I was 16, I was their youngest ever member. In fact, they had to change the rules on membership to allow me to come in. And um, I benefited so much from attending obviously what were physical events back then, meeting different people, um, learning from people's experiences. I think that was probably the key takeaway for me is you just meet some really, really interesting people and you start to learn things without even realizing you know, what you're learning. Do some CPD. CPD is becoming you know, increasingly important and it's nice because you can evidence it, you can reflect on it. My friend, the same wise friend who told me um, your career is a jungle gym, she keeps a scrapbook. So every year she puts together, you know, a, a digital scrapbook, so like a PowerPoint presentation on every, all her learning experiences. Sorry, Andy, what is CPD? CPD is continual professional development. It is recognized as um, an accredited learning experience. So you'll see events, um, I'm not sure if it's just in the UK actually, but I don't think it is. You'll see events that say, you know, three hours CPD. And that is recognized by professional institutions like the Energy Institute and the IET. It's also recognized by employers on a lot of occasions. So, so it's worth doing that. And you can record all of that in your scrapbook. So you can, you know, have sort of quotes and just things that you remember, you know, little things that you've learned in this book. And it's something you can reflect on over, over the years on your sort of learning journey. Something that I think is really important, you know, whether you're in employment, whether you're in university, whether you've got your own business, whatever it is, wherever you are, always constructively challenge the people you work with, whether that's your superiors, your mentors, your peers, if you do not feel able to challenge in a constructive way the people that you're working with, then you have to make that assessment of whether this is a positive learning environment for you to be in. So it goes back to taking responsibility for your own learning and learning strategies and remembering that learning can be a bad experience. So you have to make sure that you're in an environment where you feel safe to challenge and you feel able to be creative and to pr propose new ideas. So on that front, be creative, make your role an entrepreneurial one. Large organizations sometimes advertise for entrepreneurs, smaller organizations, you ha may have to make that your role. You know, you may have to deliberately seek out projects and opportunities to do creative and innovative things. And I promise you, it's, it's a really, really beneficial learning experience. Sometimes not all good, actually, but, um, but a really, really interesting experience. And finally, one which is often really overlooked is teaching. Pass your knowledge on to others. This is a fantastic way to improve your own understanding of a subject or to develop your own opinion of a subject. Every time I give one of these presentations, I always aim to stretch my own understanding of the topic it is that I'm that I'm delivering because that helps me to learn as well. So parting words, remember to always be critically open minded in your learning experience and always be deliberately opportunistic in seeking out those learning experiences. Thank you very much for your time. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, actually, but I'm, I'm sure we've got time for some questions. I will hand back over. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, you actually did very well on time. <laughs> it leaves us with, with a lot of time for, for questions. So, uh, you know, you guys are welcome to unmute yourself or, or write a question in the, in, in the chat box. Please, please go ahead. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, hi, Jessica. My name is Mark. Uh, thanks for the talk. Very, very nice. Um, just a question about how you um, approach a small company, say, and, and tell them you want to be become an entrepreneur. Like, how do you create that role? I get that they might understand what it is, but how, if they're a small company with potentially not a lot of funding, how would you be able to tell them, oh, spare what little resources you have to fund my ideas? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question, Mark. Thank you for that. Um, I think you're, you're right, actually. They probably won't understand what an entrepreneur is. And if you approach them and say, I'd really like to be an entrepreneur, you might frighten them, actually. Um, I always found with smaller organizations, the best way to sell an idea is to show the return on investment. So quite often, you know, with an innovative idea, it can be difficult. I mean, I always remember you know, when we were sort of approaching big data, how do you sell big data? You know, it's, it's certainly at the time, it was such an out there concept, but you almost have to take what is a very sort of, um, you know, whatever your creative innovative idea is, you have to take that idea and distill it down into something that you can, you know, demonstrate what the return on investment for the company is gonna be and show it to them preferably, you know, as engineers in, in figures show it to them in numbers. How can you benefit their organization um, if, you, if you were to deliver this thing? Obviously with smaller organizations as well, they may uh, be concerned about you spending time on other things when you have you know, obviously a, a role that is full time. So sometimes it can help to obviously put a bit of time in of your own, spend a little bit of time working on that and then show it to them you know, supplementary to your role as well. Not sure if that helps, Mark. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Thank you. Hi, Jessica. Uh, thank you for that and your presentation. I'd just like to ask a question on reverse mentorship, which you rose towards the end of your presentation. Uh, how would you approach uh, reverse mentoring someone and what values could you uh, I could propose to the person? <laughs> again that's a really really difficult question isn't it again I think reverse mentoring is not a common concept it's becoming more sort of spoken about but again if you sort of went up to someone and said can I reverse mentor you they may be offended I think you have to firstly seek out somebody who you know is open-minded that's something that's really important, you know, with any sort of learning experience, you have to find people who are open to a new experience. Um, and so they may, they may be, you know, very sort of senior you know, chief executive or director within your organization, or they may be somebody who's a bit more maverick. You know, um, I can remember some sort of an engineer in particular, he was a principal engineer. He was very well respected in the organization. He wasn't management but he was certainly different. He was open-minded. And I think we had a very, very interesting sort of informal reverse mentoring relationship just because we managed to find that level on which we can connect. So I think to some degree, it needs to be quite organic unless you have official processes in, in your organization, you know, schemes you can sign up to, but most people don't. So I think it needs to be quite organic. I think you need to get to know the person. You need to assess whether you know, what you've got to offer them is going to be beneficial to them, but equally have they got something to offer you. And generally that relationship will then grow. That's very interesting. Uh, I've never, never heard of the subject. So great. Thank you for your opinion on it. <laughs> no problem. There's, there's, um, there's a lot of research on it online. So there's certainly, okay. you know, some things you can read up on, but I think if it's not a well-known concept, it needs to be quite organic. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. It would be a bit awkward approaching uh, your CEO. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, Shagda, would you like to ask your questions? Just unmute yourself. So Shagda was asking, what are some success factors for entrepreneurs? Mm-hmm. I think the main one 
and it's true for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs is resilience absolutely personal resilience it is not about how many times you fail it's about how you recover from those failures uh, there's a quote i can't remember who it's by but it says life is 10 percent what you experience and 90 percent how you react to it so i think probably the critical factor of success for an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur is is personal resilience um you know other things that are important i think sort of again being open-minded um some people are naturally creative some people need to develop creativity um it's always you know interesting to absorb creativity from others so who you surround yourself with as an entrepreneur is really really important as well having that support network because in many organizations even big organizations where there are sort of entrepreneur schemes um, I, we had one before it was like an accelerator a seed accelerator program or something you still have a lot of people who doubt entrepreneurship and doubt what you're trying to achieve uh, we used to get told that we lived in this ivory tower and that we were you know seen as special compared to to other people and that can be a difficult thing to get over so you have to surround yourself with a really really good support network because it's tough Hi, yeah. Hi. Hello. Yeah, well, t t thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Maidin. So thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, interesting talk. My, my question is about the, uh, the you know, the, the, the time. I know it may vary from person to person, but what, what do you think would be the ideal average time for professionals uh, that should be dedicated to, to learning? Oh, okay. So the amount of time dedicated to learning. Yeah, the percentage, yes, so, sort of, yeah. Ah, that's really interesting. So th there's some research on it. Um, so Google actually have a, have a scheme where they afford 20% of every employee's time. Obviously, they're, you know, big, uh, lucrative organizations. So they can afford to do it. But they give everybody 20% of their time to one day a week, for example, to work on something new, creative, you know, to, to have that learning experience. And that's mm -hmm. where many of the innovations come from, you know, Google Maps, Google Books, all came from those sort of 20% projects. So that's probably what, the, you know, the, the research says. I mean, you know, what's that, eight hours a week is quite a lot. Um, that would be the same as, you know, taking on a part-time degree or something. I don't think it needs to be as black and white as that, personally. I think you... As far as you can in your in your professional role and and in your personal life, I think you have to seek out things that just stretch you, so that it's not you know I'm going to spend eight hours a week reading a book, for example. You have to try and integrate those things, you know, a little bit more. So if you're working for an international organisation, um, perhaps learning the language of the you know that the parent company or something is something that you can integrate within your role you know maybe uh, maybe a project that you're working on you can explore around that subject you know and, and develop something beyond the immediate scope of your project i think that's all learning so yeah i would i don't think there is a cut and dry time even though some people would disagree i think just try and integrate as much as you can yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Andy, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your questions that you posted in the chat? Yeah. Hi, Jessica. I thought, thought to take the questions in a bit of another direction. So, um, you know, obviously in our now normal distanced COVID world, um, in-person learning probably has become um, really problematic and um, many companies aren't supporting going to in-person training events. So maybe just a bit more, how are you seeing virtual learning develop and, and how can you try and recover some of the, the obvious benefits of doing stuff in person versus what we're now all having to do, which is stare into screens and pretend we're there in person. Yeah, so just, just a bit of your view on that. Yeah, okay. I think that's really interesting. I think there are going to be huge developments in the sort of digital learning space in the next couple of years. In fact, I'm surprised that they haven't really happened already. 
Um, I think in the UK, you know, you may have seen the sort of fiasco around the exam situation. So we kind of cancelled exams, you know, expected them to go forward next year. And now they're sort of slowly being cancelled again. And for me, I'm sort of sitting back and going, well, why weren't you working on a digital strategy to make sure that people could continue that learning at home so that you didn't have to cancel them? But it's also opened up this huge debate around exams generally. And are exams a good way of, you know, testing somebody's learning? And if you go back to Bloom's taxonomy, in some ways, they're probably not. Because what you're testing in an examination most of the time um, is that you're testing whether someone can remember something. Very often, you're not even testing whether somebody understands it. So there is huge sort of debate and I think huge room for disruption around traditional learning and how that looks like, you know, in the future. For me, I think things like MOOCs, massive online courses, um, are definitely gonna see an increase in take up. I think things like the micro MBA that uh, sort of Harvard and MIT and things are doing, I think they're gonna become really, really popular because it's bite-sized chunks of learning that you can do in your own time. It doesn't take four years to complete it. You know, it may take you a month, it, it may take you four years, but it's, it's down to you. You control that learning experience. So I definitely think they are going to become more sort of um, prevalent as time moves on. But I also think, you know, these sorts of tools, Zoom, people are becoming more com comfortable and confident using these kinds of tools. And, you know, we will get to the point where we can sit around a virtual table and have, you know, conversations where we are all learning. I think at the moment it's still, you know, a little bit formal because people are still not quite used to it. But, you know, I, I definitely think, I mean, it's, it's things like Black Mirror, isn't it? If anyone's seen that. But I definitely think we're going to get to that point where the virtual reality is, is almost as good as that physical reality. Yeah, because I, I think one of the things I, I certainly have experienced is, is there's more of a, a, an energy drain in the virtual environment than often I experienced in a physical environment. So rather than being energized through the learning, it, it, it can almost have the opposite effect. Um, and, and the richness that came from the other people that you learned alongside has almost been lost by almost that sort of single mindedness of self self learning. So sort of getting what I need versus learning from also the group that you're around. So, yeah, I, I, I think you, I, I like your view of it, that it's definitely an area ready for disruption. Mm -hmm. are, are you seeing anyone really doing stuff that's remarkably different that we could go learn from and learn with? I think there probably are some examples. I'd probably have to have a little think and maybe send something across. If I'm honest, I'm not, there's not as much, you know, there's not much that's impressing me at the moment in this space, but I, I think there may be sort of, you know, political reasons and, and an element of denial. I think that's all, always the case in these sort of situations. People almost, you know, can't quite accept um, it's like the seven stages of grief, isn't it? They can't quite accept the situation that we're in and that it isn't going to go back to that physical reality because I don't think it will. So I'm not seeing a huge amount that impresses me. I've seen a couple of things which I'll, I'll try and send around. Um, but yeah, I think this space is ripe for disruption and I think this space is ripe for, you know, engineers in particular and people who want to become entrepreneurs to do something in this space because it's, I don't think it's going to go back to how it was. I mean, when you combine, you know, the pandemic with all of the movements around the environment, which you'll obviously be, you know, very, very familiar with more so than me, it's hard to imagine travel going back to the way it was, for example. It's hard to imagine vehicle usage going back to the way that it was. Um, so yeah, this, this space is ripe for disruption. Thank you. I think we might have run out. <laughs> uh, Shad, did, you, did you have a comment about what we just, just said? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I think I just want to ask you, uh, Jessica, like what are some, you know, some high level remarks about things here in the region, if you have any 
idea. I know that apprenticeship is not really a thing um, yet, as, as you mentioned, but do you think that we will move towards that or do you think we will kind of skip that and move into something else? Kind of what's beyond apprenticeship, let's say. Well, that's a very interesting question, Sharda. I, I, I think personally, it's how do we evolve the apprenticeship? Because I think the, the core principles of an apprenticeship, which were, of course, you know, sort of learning a, a trade and an occupation. Um, I think that's still valid, but I agree with you that perhaps those occupations are moving faster than, you know, the time taken to, to complete that apprenticeship. I think for me, something that we're working on at Youngo, and this is where I sort of see the future, is in a globally connected careers infrastructure. So I see, you know, sort of education and training being based on skills rather than knowledge, because we live in a knowledge economy and we can get any knowledge we need over Google. So it's, it's less about knowing things now and it's more about being able to do things. So I see it becoming much more skills based I see, you know, in my mind, and this is probably a bit of a utopian view, but I see this globally connected infrastructure where it doesn't really matter where you're based anymore. It doesn't matter if you're in the UAE or if you're in, you know, the UK. I mean, we're having this conversation now and it's easy. There's no barriers to us doing this. And so I see this infrastructure where people can, you know, firstly identify what it is that they want to do work out how their skills apply to that and actually be able to work for any company in any part of the world in a very sort of, you know, a fluid way. And in that infrastructure, I think we're all moving around. I don't think it's, you know, a case of working towards this job or this, you know, this ultimate career goal. I think it is that jungle gym. And I think that's what that sort of model affords us is for us to move around, develop new experiences, transfer best practice, I think that's that's my sort of vision for it. But feel free to disagree with me. Very interested to hear what other people think. Hi. Hello. Yeah. It, yeah. Hi. It, it, it's it's Maidin again. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, I have a question regarding. I mean, the fact that uh, most of us uh, keep learning on a lifelong basis. And uh, so do, do you think that the uh, traditional ways of, uh, of assessing uh, employees by employers, uh, the, the reward schemes, and that kind of, uh, you know, uh, processes will uh, change or will have to adapt, uh, you know, in the future as, again, everybody is more or less learning and uh, maybe performing better, you know, that, that, kind of, that, that kind of things. Yes, uh, again, really, really interesting question. I think you're right. I think reward systems and performance management systems, assessment systems will have to change. I think they'll have to change from education right through to employment um, and possibly integrate better as well between the two so that we're sort of assessing the same things. I think that there is a really, really interesting opportunity to rewrite employment contracts. So that might sound a bit strange, but I think employment contracts have been traditionally based on you will do 40 hours a week in this particular location. What value does that add? One person's 40 hours a week, you know, maybe huge value. And that obviously gets picked up in the current performance management system. Another person's 40 hours, you know, may result in 50% in of the benefit. And so I think there is a really interesting opportunity to rewrite employment contracts based on value creation, based on, you know, responsibilities, based on creativity, as opposed to just, I work 40 hours a week in this organization. And I think what that will provide is flexibility for people in their lives you know to have a better work-life balance for example i don't know how much that's sort of being talked about in the uae It'd be quite interesting to get your feedback on that but the idea of you know do people need to work five days a week from an office you know th there are lots of arguments against that commercial space for example if, if people were allowed to work more flexibly more remotely then you may not need as much commercial space so there's you know savings for the organization 
There are benefits for people who may have childcare commitments, elder care commitments, hobbies that they need to do at certain times. You know, are we moving into a future where we don't need people working nine to five anymore from an office? Um, and if that's the case, then you're right. How do we assess those people? And I think it's based on the value that they add. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think uh, the, the key word uh, there is is uh, maybe is, is flexibility from from all perspectives. Yeah. Thank Definitely. you. Thank, thank you. Great. Are there any other questions from from anyone? Look, thank you all so much yeah. for coming today and, and thank you for a, a really, really interesting discussion. You've certainly stretched my mind with some of those questions and, and given me some things to go away and learn as well. So I hope it's been beneficial for you. Uh, feel free to connect with me. Um, there has been a, a question about LinkedIn, of course. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on Twitter as well if you want to find me there. Let's keep the conversation going and best of luck to you all in your learning and career journeys fantastic thank you so much jessica really grateful you found the time to to connect with us and our network in the middle east this evening uh this talk will be available on on youtube um uh, i think uh Shata just posted a link and uh, yeah i wish everybody a fantastic evening and thank you very much for for your participation and great questions and again thank you so much jessica for joining us have a good evening everyone <laughs>